Well, good morning, Northridge Church. Uh, I want to take a second and just welcome all of our campuses here at Arondacoy, at Greece, and Webster. And for those of you who couldn't make it watching online, it is so good to be here today. Uh, I'm, I'm absolutely excited. And I just want to take a second and thank you from the bottom of my heart and my wife's heart. Um, it's been an incredible week just getting a chance to hear some of your stories, to, to hang out with you guys, and just to get to know you a little bit better. Um, you know, there's just been one constant theme for me and my wife this whole week, and it's the fact that God is really moving inside of this church. And so I am just, I'm honestly just humbled and honored to be here today. You know, there's something you need to know about me up front is I'm a planner. It's just kind of who God created me to be. Um, I live every single day by a plan. And in fact, I have a plan for today, for my week, for my year, a five-year and a, and a 10-year plan. And can, can any of you just relate to that, maybe here at Arondacoy or Grease Webster? You're just a, a planner. You're a planner. Good. I'm not the only crazy one here today. Good, good. And, and, and I think some of the reason why I plan is just the fact that I want to avoid surprises. I want to have control of, of my circumstances. And one of the worst places for me to go in the world is the airport. Um, just because I, I, I think there's just something about the airport that I just can't control my surroundings or how long the security line is. And so, you know, recently my wife and I, we were visiting family in the Rochester area. We were flying from Atlanta, Georgia. And so, you know, I figured just to avoid surprises, we'd come up with a plan. So I sat my wife down and I told her the plan. You know, my, my buddy Chad was going to pick us up and he was going to take us to the airport. And we'd have about a three-hour window where we could just kind of relax and chill and have a good experience. Because when I go to the airport, I just become a different person. Normally I'm cool, calm, and collected, but I just get anxiety and I worry, are we going to make our plan? And so the day came. It was, about, it was about 6.30. I had our bags packed. We were ready to go. The plan was in place. And so 6.45 rolls around and Chad's not there. And I'm like, okay, Drew, it's going to be okay. I look at my wife, who is the complete opposite of me. And she's just chill, like, Drew, don't worry. 6.50, 6.55. 7 o'clock, and at this point, I'm in full panic mode. I'm sweating down my back, like, we're going to miss our flight. What are we going to do? And my phone, a text message comes on, and it's Chad. And Chad says, hey, when are you going to be at our house? <laughs> and I don't, I don't know what happened in the midst of, of our communication where Chad thought I was going to his house or where I, he, I thought he was picking us up, but I looked at my wife. I was like, get Joel, get the bags, let's get in the car. And so I grab our bags, I toss them in the car, we strap Joel in, and I'm driving about 90 in a 55-mile-an-hour zone. My wife's slapping me like, Drew, you got to slow down, and I'm praying, Lord, please forgive me. I don't mean to do this. <laughs> and, and so we, we drive, and I, I call Chad, and Chad lives in this huge neighborhood. It's about a mile to get out of his neighborhood, and I'm like, Chad, listen, we're running late you need to run out your neighborhood. So I make him run a mile, and I'm like, hey, we're not going to stop. Just jump in. We're going to slow down. Just, just, just jump in. And so we pick up Chad, and we, we get to the airport, and we get through security. We, we, we check our bags, and we ride the tram, and we get to our gate. And I look at my watch, and I realize we still have an hour before boarding even begins. I sit down, and my wife sits next to me, and she says, Drew, you're a mess. And then she said these words, she said, you know, sometimes you just can't plan for everything. And isn't that true about life today? That no, ma no matter how hard we try to control our circumstances, life has a way of just throwing us curves, curves that we, we don't expect, curves we, we can't plan for. You see, it happened to a nation. It happened to the nation of Israel in Exodus chapter 12, verse 31. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If you're using one of the Northridge Bibles, it's page 54. But before we jump into this text, I just want to kind of set the scene for you. I want to give you a little background information on what's taking place. You see, the nation of Israel has been in bondage to one of the greatest empires in, in this time frame, in the, in the empire of, of Egypt. They've been slaves for 400 years. So they've been praying and praying and praying, God, please deliver us. Please, God, we want freedom. But after 400 years, it's kind of like we've lost hope. We've given up. The reality's just set in. Maybe God just wants us to be slaves. 
But then something changes when God sends a man named Moses to deliver them from the Egyptians' hands. And so Moses stands before Pharaoh and he says, God wants you to let his people go. But scripture says that God hardens the heart of Pharaoh and he continually says, no, no. So Moses and and Pharaoh, they go through this series of plagues until the last plague takes the firstborn son of Pharaoh. And that's exactly where we're going to pick up the text today in Exodus chapter 12, verse 31. It says this. It says, during the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, up and leave my people, you and the Israelites. Go worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said and go and bless me. So Pharaoh loses his son through this this last plague, and he he calls Moses in and Aaron, and he says, get out. I'm tired of you. Like, you're free to go. Get out. Take Israel and leave. And just for a second, can you imagine what that must have felt like? They've been slaves. All they know is chains and whips and taking orders. And finally, those words, they hear, you're free. You know, I think a lot of times we we read through Scripture and we overlook the idea of, do you realize how long 400 years is? Just to give us a little perspective, just a a couple months ago, we celebrated freedom as a nation, and it's only been 240 years for us, And, and Israel's been in bondage for over double that time. And finally, those words come, you're free to go. Can you imagine the celebration Can you imagine the feeling of joy? Like, we've been waiting for this. We've been praying for this. Like, oh my, this is it. See, probably some of you today can relate to that because you've been praying for something for 5, 10, 15, maybe even 50 years, and you remember that moment where God answered that prayer. You see, for my family, it was a baby. About seven years ago, my wife and I, we had been married for three years, and we came together, and we just said, hey, what do you think about starting a family? And I don't know about you, but I just thought it would be easy. I thought a couple years, we'd have a couple kids, the American dream. But God had a different story for, for us as a family. And so we jumped in this journey, and we, 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 were, we were like, oh, so excited. This is going to be great. We're going to have a baby. But two years into it, not even really hope. Not even a scare, or or, or maybe this is it. And so my wife and I, we kind of had a conversation. Maybe we should see some doctors. Maybe we should see if something's wrong with you or there's something wrong with me. And so we just kind of took a year and bounced from doctor to doctor to doctor, just looking for hope. Looking like, hey, maybe just keep trying. It's going to work. And we were just kind of left with, maybe this just isn't in the cards for us. Maybe this just isn't something God wants for us. But I remember that moment. It was Christmas Day. I woke up, and right next to the pillow, right on the pillow next to mine was a present. And my wife was staring at me in this kind of weird glance. (laughs) I opened up the present, and there it was, a positive pregnancy test. And I remember that feeling of just, thank you, God, for hearing our prayer. And I bet you that's probably how Israel feels in this moment. Where they've been in slavery, generation after generation have been slaves, and finally we're free. But what I've noticed about life is no matter how good it's going or how bad it's going, life can change in a moment's notice. I mean, that's the amazing thing about life is, is, is life doesn't give you warning signals. Like, hey, there's a change coming. Get ready. It might get a little rocky. Or, or, or hey, detour ahead. No, life just changes in the snap of a finger. And a lot of times, we're just not prepared for it. It's exactly what happened to me. You see, about five years ago, I was a high school pastor in the state of Georgia. And God was doing some amazing things in our ministry. We were seeing kids far from God just, just come to, the, to meet Jesus, their hope and their salvation. And God took a ministry of about 90 students and grew, and grew it to about 500. 
And it was summer. We just finished our summer camp. We were heading into a new year. We had a huge kickoff. We were expecting a thousand high schoolers to come, come experience Jesus. And I remember the day, it was August 7th, and I was at my house, and I was going over my message. I was preaching it in the mirror, and if you don't realize this, us pastors, we do that. And, you know, I was going over my message, and something changed. I was struggling to breathe. And, you know, as a young guy, I was like, hey, breathing should probably come natural to me. And so I picked up the phone, and I called my wife, and, and, and I just kind of told her my symptoms. My wife's a registered nurse. She knows kind of the medical field. And I was like, hey, babe, I, I, I'm struggling to breathe. And she's like, Drew, you need to go to the hospital. And I was like, I'm preaching to about 1,000 kids tonight. There, I, I've got plans. Like, I can't just, oh, sure. No, I got, I got responsibilities to do. So she put a doctor on the phone, and the doctor said, Drew, if you don't go to the hospital, you could die. And I was a young guy. I mean, death never really entered the equation. I I thought I was invincible. So I made a deal with my wife that I would go to the urgent care right down the road. And, you know, i just make sure I wasn't going to die, and we'd figure it out later. And so I, 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 it's probably a good idea, you know. And so I drove to the urgent care, and they did all these tests, EKGs, and I don't even know all the terms for it. I was just like, they couldn't find anything wrong with me until they did a chest x-ray. And I remember the doctor walking into the room, and he said, Drew, you need to go to the hospital immediately because your lung is 60% collapsed. So I went to the hospital, met with the surgeon, and they put a chest tube in my side. They blew my lung back up. Surgeon walked in. He said, hey, this was a crazy kind of crazy thing, and, and three days at the hospital and a week of recovery, and you'll be back to normal. I was like, okay, that's not a big deal. Just a bump in the road, no big deal. Until a week later, it happened again. And so we, my wife and I, we jumped in the car and we headed to the hospital, same hospital, and I knew it was bad this time when they immediately put me in an ambulance and drove me to downtown Atlanta. And so we met with another surgeon and I watched my wife as the surgeon was kind of just talking through the procedure that was about to take place and you could see in, in her face it was getting paler and paler and paler and you could see worry filling her heart. It was the first time in my life that I thought, maybe this is it. Maybe this is where I say goodbye to my wife and my family, and maybe this is the end of my story. What's amazing is the day before it all happened, I was perfectly fine. Because life somehow has a way of, of, of twisting and turning and, and we don't know exactly what to expect. And you see this in this passage where, where the Israelites are stepping into their freedom and then something changes in the story. If you have your Bibles, Exodus chapter 14, we're going to pick up the passage in verse 5. It says this. It says, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We've let Israel go. We've lost their services. So he had his chariots made ready, and he took his army with him. He took 600 of his best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Piharath, opposite of Baal Zeplon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. Here the Israelites are dreaming about the houses they're going to build, the plans they're going to make, the choices they're going to make, and they look over their shoulder and everything changes because the Egyptians are coming back for them. And I think some of us today, we can relate to the surprises of life because maybe for you today, it was like that. It was a simple doctor's office visit, and you or someone you love heard those words, you have cancer, and everything has changed. Or maybe it was you who was just a visit to your boss's office and they said, hey, we're going to have to let you go. And your life has dramatically changed. I think if anybody can relate to the surprises of life, it would be you guys in Northridge Church because on March 13th, your phenomenal, amazing lead pastor stood before you and said, God's calling me in a different direction. 
And for a lot of you, that was a close friend, a leader, a spiritual father. And you looked up to God and said, this is not the way it's supposed to go. This is not what I planned for, God. The same thing happened to the nation of Israel. They're stepping into their freedom, and then everything changes. And for a moment, I just want to pause here. I want to pause here because I, want, I think there's two things that we can understand about the surprises of life. The first thing is, as Christians, as followers of Christ, of believers, as Christians, the world is waiting and watching to see how we react to life's surprises. You see, in Philippians, in Philippians, God declares that he will give us a peace that goes beyond all our circumstances, our, our understanding. And when life throws us a curveball, the world looks to believers and says, I want to see if that's real. I want to see if that's evident, if that's really true. You see, the world is going to be waiting and watching to see how we react to life's curveballs, to the surprises, the unexpected. The second thing I think we need to understand is is how we react to those surprises says a lot about who we are, but more importantly, whose we are. You see, I think a lot of us today, we look at these these crazy surprises in life and we think we view them as negatives. But I believe God wants to use those as opportunities for us to declare to the world who our God is and where our faith belongs. And so we have to understand these things about the surprises in life. And you you get a chance to see further in the story as as Israel is is taken surprised by by the Egyptians coming, they begin to respond. It says this, it says they were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They they were terrified. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us here to the desert to die? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die here in the desert. And you begin to see the responses of Israel. The first one was, they panicked. What are we going to do? Like, there's an army coming after us. We have no no shot. Like, what are we going to do? The second thing that you see them is, they blame. Moses. This is your fault. Why would you bring us here? We were happy being slaves. Why did you take us here to the desert to die? And I got to be honest, as I was preparing this message and I was reading this passage, I found myself over and over again judging the Israelites. Like, come on, guys. We're better than this. I can't. Come, Come on. And yet, God often reminded me of how many times when surprise, a life threw me a surprise, I found myself panicking and blaming people for my circumstances. And I think often we panic and we blame because we've lost control. Control is a unique word because I think as Christians, we often crave and desire control. But we were never truly designed to have it. And what's amazing is, is Israel is panicking, they're blaming, and, and, and I just think God wants a different response for us today. I think when life goes crazy and chaotic and, and you're taken back by the surprises of life, I don't think God wants us to panic. I don't think God wants us to blame. I, I think God wants us to do something so simple but so hard and trust in Him. When life goes crazy, our response is to trust. You hear that word a lot in church today. You hear it a lot in our world today, to trust. But I wonder how many of us truly understand what the biblical idea of trust is. You see, to trust in God means really two things. It means to realize, or it's a realization that you are never in control in the first place. That your circumstances, you could never control them. And then secondly, it's, it's a surrender. It's a heart surrender of, of the fact or the thought that you were ever in control in the first place. You see, when you say, I'm going to trust in God, you're saying, God, I can't fix my situation. I can't control my situation, and I'm surrendering it to you. That's what it means to trust in God. And we trust in God for three things. The first thing we trust in God is we trust that he's sovereign, that he is in control. That he knows what's best. We, we, we trust that God is sovereign and he, he knows exactly what took place before it even took place. The second thing is we trust that God knows best. 
I don't know about you, but I'm just so glad that God writes my story for me, that God doesn't allow me to choose where and what I want to do because at the end of the day, my life would be a mess. I'm so thankful that God knows what's best for me at the right time and the right place. And then third and finally, we trust that God loves us. You know, maybe you're here today and this whole idea of church or Jesus is new to you. Man, I just want you to know something today, that there is a God who is deeply and madly in love with you, and he gave up his one and only son for you. And so we trust in the fact that God is sovereign, he knows what's best for us, and we trust that he loves us. And so Israel is here, they're, they're panicking, they're blaming, and then their leader stands. And here we pick up the passage, it says, Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. I love this part of the passage because it's kind of that, you know, the guy in me, it's like that brave heart moment. The battle's about to take place and, and Moses stands and he gives this battle speech. And you got to remember, Moses stands and he's talking not to a couple hundred people. This is a nation. This is about a million to two million people. And Moses stands and he's like, all right, guys, here's what we're going to do. I know there's an army coming after us. I know we don't know how to fight, but are you ready? Here's the plan. All we got to do is to be still. Really, Moses? This was your moment. This was your, your guy moment to like rally the troops and you're like, hey, let's freeze. Maybe they won't see us. <laughs> but I think Moses understood something in this, in this moment. I think Moses looked at the Egyptian army and he realized they were armed. They had horses. They were trained. They were ready for battle. And here Israel is, slaves, tired, they have no clue how to fight. I think Moses realized that there was nothing he could do to fix the problem, that it was way beyond his control. And what Moses is saying to the nation of Israel, I think the same thing God is saying to us today in those moments, we have to be still or simply trust that God will come through. I love those two words, to be still. Because you find them somewhere else in Scripture, in Psalm chapter 46, verse 10, where it says, be still and know that I am God. And what's unique about those two little simple words is in the original language, you can translate them in two different ways. The first in the obvious of just sitting still and, and seeing the greatness of God. But the second way is a little different. It's the idea of being weak or being vulnerable. You see, I think that's what Moses was saying to the nation of Israel, that in our weakness, we're really our strongest because God will fight for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 says it better than I could. It says this, it says that my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. And that is the complete opposite of what the world teaches today, that we have to be strong. But Moses was saying to, to the entire nation, hey, good news, we don't have to be strong today because our God will fight for us, that he will stand up and he will take care of the Egyptians today. I remember laying in that hospital bed. I had an epidural in my back. I had tubes coming out of every nook and cranny of my body. And it was right before they pushed me into surgery. My wife and the pastors had left from praying for me. And it was just me and God. I remember looking up at the sterile ceiling tiles of the hospital, and I just remember saying, God, there is nothing I can do to fix my lung. There's not, I don't have the knowledge, the skill. This is way beyond my control. And I remember looking up to God and saying, I'm just giving it to you. I'm surrendering that control to you, God, because at the end of the day, I trust you. I think one of the hardest things in life is trusting in God when you can't see where he's going or you don't understand why. And maybe that's you today. 
Maybe you're struggling to trust God because you heard those words, I have cancer, or someone you love has cancer, and you have no clue why God would bring this in your life. Or maybe today you lost your job and you have no clue how you're going to pay your bills, how you're going to support your family, and, and you're thinking, like, how, how can I trust God in this moment? Or maybe you're a student here today and, and you're trying to figure out who you are or where to go to college or, or what you want to be and you're like, God's not answering me. I've been praying and praying, but how can I trust God? Or maybe you're here today and you're single and you're saying, I've been, I, I've been wanting that person, that Mr. Right or Mr. M Mrs. Right, and, and you've been praying, but God's silent on you and you're like, how can I trust God? Man, it is very difficult when life throws you a surprise to stand on that truth and trust in God when you can't see and when you don't know. You were given a card just like this when you walked into the auditorium today. And on the card it says, when trusting God is hard and there's a blank. And I'd encourage you in this moment to write down that area where you're just struggling to trust God today, where it's really, really difficult to trust God. Maybe it's your finances today. Maybe it's your future. Maybe it's your circumstances. Where is it difficult, where you're struggling, where you're saying, God, I don't know. I, I need to cling to control because I can fix my problem. Can I just tell you the truth today that the only person that can fix your problem is Jesus? And so would you write that down on that card? And what I'd like you to do with this is as you leave today, to take this card and put it somewhere where you're going to see it regularly this next week. Maybe it's your, your car dash, your office at work, the refrigerator at home, your locker at school. And every time you see that, I want you to pray, God, please help me to surrender control and trust in you. Psalms chapter 25, verse 1, it says this. In you, Lord, in you, Lord, my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. You see, today when we trust God, no matter the circumstance, we reveal his glory for the world to see. You see, when you trust God in the good, in the easy, when you trust God in the hard, in the painful, when it hurts and it's broken, you get a chance to let the world see who our God really is. Let's pray. Lord, today I'm so thankful that no matter what life brings me, no matter how good or how bad it gets, that I can stand on the truth that you will never leave me, that you will never forsake me, that you will always be there, and I can trust in you. And so, God, I pray for the individual today that is, is just struggling. Life is hard, and, and they don't know what to do. I pray that they would trust in you in all circumstances. Thank you that we can lean on you. In Jesus' name, amen. That is my prayer for this church, that no matter the circumstance, that our trust would know no borders. You know, I really believe this today, that you can't really trust God with your circumstances until you've trusted him with your heart. And maybe today that's you, where God has just been speaking to you, and you want to take that next step, where you just surrender your life to Jesus, where you make him the forgiver and leader of your life. One of our pastors will be right here at the end of the service. That they would love to connect with you. And maybe you're here today and God's been speaking to you and you want to take your next step in the journey that God's been taking you on. Again, one of our pastors will be here. I just want to say from my heart, thank you so much for being an amazing church. It's been a wonderful week. Uh, I'm going to pray us out. And so will you pray with me? Lord, thank you so much for what you're doing in this church. Thank you for the lives that are represented here today that have been impacted by the gospel. And God, I pray that you would continue that that you would have your hand of favor on this church. And we just believe our trust is in you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful day.